In the past 30 years, the Soviet Union has progressed from a war-ravaged nation with a military capability greatly inferior to that of the United States to a point today where it has achieved a rough strategic parity with us and is now striving for military superiority. A recent Library of Congress study concludes that the Soviet Union alone among all countries in the world today has sufficient strength to challenge America militarily in many areas of mutual interest overseas and bring power to bear on our homeland. One major factor that has allowed the Soviets to make such rapid strides is their huge investment in military research and development. Today, they are turning out weaponry of a quality generally comparable to that of any other nation in the world. Achievement of world technical superiority is a national goal, which has been echoed by every Soviet leader since Lenin. In 1948, Stalin stated that the USSR will achieve technical superiority over the capitalist nations of the world. And this goal has not been abandoned. Each year since 1970, the Soviets have spent more for development of new weapon systems than the United States and are currently investing approximately 25% more than we are. This investment could allow them to achieve superiority unless we support a dynamic research and development program of our own. In reviewing Soviet intercontinental strike forces, the Library of Congress has noted that over the last 10 years, the Soviet Union has added to its force the equivalent of the entire U.S. ICBM force in numbers of launchers. This amounts to three times the nuclear payload. They currently have about 1,600 ICBMs as compared to our 1,054. Their currently deployed force consists primarily of five types of ICBMs developed during the 1960s. Their older systems are being replaced with four new, more advanced ICBMs developed in the 1970s. Three have demonstrated multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles, MIRV, which allows their several warheads to be placed on separate targets. Two of their systems use a launch technique that allows their silos to be reloaded in a relatively short time. One of the missiles is probably being developed as a land mobile system, which, if deployed, will add to their force survivability. Despite this massive investment in force modernization, there are indications from various sources that the Soviets are continuing with the development of even newer and better strategic ballistic missiles. Their medium range and intermediate range ballistic missile force, which can now launch about 600 missiles, is also being improved by the development of a new, sophisticated, land-mobile IRBM that carries a MIRG payload. In the second element of their strategic triad, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, the Soviets surpassed the United States in the number deployed in 1974. And in mid-1976, have about 800 missile launchers on some 60 nuclear-powered submarines. They do not have MIRV-capable SLBMs. However, their biggest submarine missile can deliver a warhead to a range of 4,200 nautical miles. This allows them to operate at greater distances from our coast and complicates our problem of anti-submarine warfare and missile launch detection. The Soviets have placed less emphasis on manned bombers. They have over 200 long-range bombers in their inventory or about one-third as many as the United States Air Force. This strategic bomber force is made up of the turboprop-powered Bear and the all-jet Bison. Both are configured for air-to-surface missiles or gravity bombs. A vastly superior new intercontinental bomber, the Backfire, has been deployed in their nuclear strike force. Even without refueling, it could reach targets over much of the United States. The Library of Congress study 
indicates that the Soviets have whittled away our overwhelming strategic lead and have now surpassed the United States in the total number of strategic delivery vehicles. In general, our strategic weaponry is considered somewhat more sophisticated than the Soviets. However, they are actively striving to overcome our current technological edge. In the area of strategic defense, the Soviets have developed the most extensive and expensive air defense force in the world. They operate over 5,000 early warning and ground control intercept radar sites. The Soviet fighter interceptor force, dedicated to home defense, is composed of some 2,700 aircraft, as compared to about 400 interceptors in the United States and their forces being modernized by the introduction of such aircraft as the Mach 3 Foxbat, a high altitude interceptor reconnaissance fighter introduced first in the late 1960s. We expect the Soviets to deploy a new defense version of the swing wing flogger armed with four air to air missiles and an internal gun. In the post 1980 time frame, an entirely new interceptor is expected to go operational. A significant portion of this force is protected by hardened aircraft shelters, and this holds true for their tactical fighters as well. From the standpoint of surface-to-air missiles for home defense, the Soviets have nearly 12,000. The United States has none dedicated to this mission. They have four types of SAMs deployed at fixed positions in the most critical areas of the Soviet Union. They range from early models, which literally ring Moscow, to newer road transportable systems capable of intercepting both low-flying and extremely high-flying supersonic aircraft. It is readily apparent that the Soviets have developed a massive capability for strategic defense and are actively developing new weapons to ensure continued modernization of this force through future years. Regarding the Soviet general purpose forces, it may be stated that with the sole exception of helicopters, the Soviets have a significant numerical superiority in all major elements of ground, naval, and tactical air forces. And they are continuing to upgrade their capabilities across the board. Their medium tank is comparable to the best U.S. tank, and they recently began production of a new medium tank. They are introducing new self-propelled artillery to replace towed artillery, thereby improving operational flexibility. In addition to large numbers of artillery rockets, the Soviets have deployed tactical missiles and rockets for battlefield operations. These include surface-to-surface -surface unguided rockets and guided missiles that have a range from 165 to 500 miles. One of the more important trends in force improvement has been the development of five mobile surface-to-air systems for defensive ground forces against air attack during fluid battlefield situations. These include the SA-4, designed to intercept medium to high altitude intruders. The mobile SA-6. The SA-8. SA-9. And the shoulder-mounted SA-7 for defense against low-flying aircraft. These mobile surface-to-air missiles are complemented by a four-barrel, 23-millimeter self-propelled anti-aircraft gun. Together, they form a highly mobile air defense system for tactical operations. The Soviets have the world's largest force of combat surface ships, and this force is also being modernized. By 1977, almost half of these ships are expected to be armed with surface-to-air or anti-ship missiles. Some of the anti-ship missiles have ranges of over 200 nautical miles and are very accurate.
they have been expanding their anti-submarine warfare capability by deploying the Moskva and Leningrad anti-submarine warfare cruisers, which carry about 20 helicopters and are armed with surface-to-air missiles. In 1973, the Soviets launched their first aircraft carrier, the Kiev class, which will probably go operational later this year. This carrier is expected to be equipped with a combination of helicopters and new fighters, having a vertical and short takeoff and landing capability. With regard to tactical aviation, the Soviets have been significantly improving the capabilities of their theater air forces by the rapid introduction of advanced tactical aircraft and improved munitions. The newer aircraft, specifically the late model fish beds, swing wing fitters, floggers and fencers, have substantially improved range, payload, avionics, and electronic countermeasure capabilities. These new aircraft already comprise a significant portion of the force, providing improved operational flexibility and efficiency. Naval and Air Force tactical air capabilities are complemented by several hundred blinder and badger medium-range bombers, many of which have long-range air-to-surface missiles for use against both land and sea targets. In an all-out nuclear war, any number of these medium bombers could be used on one-way missions against the United States. Utilization of the new backfire in a theater strike role would also greatly improve Soviet tactical and naval capabilities. The Soviets have a significant airlift capability using the AN-22, which can operate from semi-prepared surfaces and can transport bulky heavy equipment, such as mobile missiles and tanks. Their new long-range cargo transport, the IL-76, comparable to RC-141, entered the operational inventory in 1974. Complementing these aircraft is the AN-12, which is used for both strategic and tactical airlift. Follow-on replacements for the AN-12 and the AN-22 are expected to go operational in the 1980 to 1981 time period. Soviet general purpose forces are the world's best equipped and prepared to launch chemical attacks and to operate under chemical, biological, and radiological warfare conditions. Chemical warfare doctrine and organization have become part of the Soviet armed forces. These forces have developed to the point today where there is no question that they are unsurpassed in their ability to undertake operations in toxic environments, both offensively and defensively. It is difficult to assess the balance of power between the United States and Soviet general purpose forces due to many divergent factors. Quantitatively, they are far ahead. Qualitatively, we probably have the lead, but even this is not certain. As the Library of Congress report states, only the crucible of combat could confirm the current United States-Soviet qualitative balance in this regard. Their currently deployed forces are the result of research and development efforts of 10 to 15 years ago. The investment they have made in military research and development from the late 1960s to the present will result in more technologically advanced and sophisticated weaponry with which to upgrade their forces during the late 1970s and well into the 80s. This is extremely critical as the Soviets have continued to improve their already massive research and development base by expanding their aerospace design bureaus, research institutes, and test facilities. They employ about 200,000 more scientists and engineers than we do in the United States. And each year, 
they graduate approximately five times more engineers, thus ensuring an even greater capability for the future. The Soviet view of their military R&D capability was expressed to the world by Secretary Brezhnev during the 23rd Communist Party Congress when he stated, our superiority in the latest types of military technology is a fact, comrades, and one can't escape facts. The Library of Congress report states that the day has passed when U.S. scientific ascendancy can be taken for granted. Soviet efforts already equal our own in several respects, surpass us in others, and exhibit strong momentum. This is the Soviet threat. This is Olive Avenue in 1928, and this is busy San Fernando Road, looking north in beautiful downtown Burbank, California. We're way out in the suburbs now, where San Fernando Road crosses the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks at Empire Avenue. This industrial center was dominated by the Empire China Company. Allen and Malcolm Lockheed leased 20,000 square feet of working space from the China factory and moved to Burbank from their Hollywood quarters in March of 1928. This is where Burbank hoped the University of California would move its campus from Vermont Avenue in Los Angeles. Westwood got the university, but Lockheed came to Burbank. The first Lockheed airplane built in Burbank was the Vega, named for the star. It was a single engine aircraft made of molded plywood. Carpenters were the largest group in the original 50-man workforce, and glue was one of the most important materials. Shortly after moving to Burbank, Lockheed received an order for 20 Vegas. This was big business for the young company, worth more than $250,000. By 1929, the workforce had grown to almost 200. Lockheed's wooden airplanes helped make aviation history. Captain Frank Hawks set transcontinental records in his Air Express. So did Colonel Art Goebel in the Vega Yankee Doodle. The Lindbergh set a west-east transcontinental record in their Cirrus. The Vega Winnie Mae was made famous by her pilot, Wiley Post. The Altair Lady Southern Cross was flown by the Australian Sir Charles Kingsford Smith. And Amelia Earhart in her Vega was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. In 1930, the airport at Burbank was completed in the wide open spaces near the Lockheed plant. Dedication ceremonies included an awesome display of air power. Formations of twin-engine Keystone bombers flew overhead with their fighter escorts to salute the city's new million-dollar airport. In 1932, the company was bought by the founders of the present Lockheed Aircraft Corporation for $40,000. The new management developed a new airplane, the all-metal twin-engine Electra, which went into airline service in the United States and abroad. The Electra was followed by the Super Electra, a larger model for corporate as well as airline use. A Super Electra set a new speed record in 1939, around the world in three days, 17 hours and 14 minutes. The pilot was Howard Hughes. By 1938, Lockheed had 250,000 square feet of floor space and 2,000 employees. Then, the big turning point. Lockheed was asked to convert the Super Electra into a bomber. 
the British government ordered 200 Hudsons in June of 1938 and agreed to buy 50 more if Lockheed could deliver all of the airplanes by December of 1939. World War II began while Lockheed was building the Hudsons. Many doubted that so many planes could be produced in such a short time, but the company delivered the 250th Hudson two months before the deadline. The British placed new orders, and production eventually totaled nearly 3,000 by war's end. Lockheed built a new plant for its subsidiary Vega Airplane Company, and in 1940 bought the adjacent airport. In the war emergency, the Army Corps of Engineers helped expand facilities to near their present size. This airport complex still is the site for Lockheed corporate headquarters and a major division, the Lockheed California Company. Then, Lockheed went to war. Factory buildings and the airport were soon under camouflage. All windows were painted or covered for blackouts. These are dummy houses and artificial shrubbery on the factory rooftops. A few months after Pearl Harbor, Lockheed rolled out its first B-17. The U.S. Army Air Corps in the summer of 1941 had asked the company to join Boeing and Douglas in building the Boeing-designed bomber. Lockheed's first flying fortress was in the air nine months later, one month ahead of the tight schedule. Lockheed started the year 1942 with the largest workforce in the American aircraft industry, 54,000 employees. Less than 14 years earlier, the new plant in Burbank had employed only 50 persons. But employment was to rise to more than 94,000 by 1943. During the war years, nearly 24,000 employees left to serve in the armed forces. To keep production lines moving, thousands of patriotic women went to work. They made up nearly 40% of Lockheed's workforce at its peak, some 35,000 women. Entertainers like Francis Lankford, Frank Sinatra, and Dinah Shore participated in morale building programs at aircraft plants during the war. From Pearl Harbor to the end of World War II, Lockheed built more than 19,000 fighters, bombers, and patrol planes. Nearly one-fourth of the total number of B-17s produced during World War II were built at Lockheed. 2,750 of them. During the 44 months that the United States was at war, the Burbank factories also turned out 5,600 faster and more heavily armed patrol airplanes, the Hudson and Ventura. But probably the most famous Lockheed warplane was the P-38. Construction of the prototype began in July 1938 and the first P-38 was delivered to the Air Corps less than six months later. It was the fastest fighter in the skies. No one at Lockheed expected the government to order more than 50 of the twin boom fighter, but production in 18 different versions reached a total of 10,000. Although it never saw combat in World War II, Lockheed's first jet airplane, the F-80 Shooting Star, was first flown in January 1944. That same year, it became America's first jet airplane to go into production. And then it was all over. Lockheed and its employees had made a tremendous contribution to the Allied war effort. But for tens of thousands of employees, peace meant a pink slip. Employment had been steadily decreasing from the 1943 peak and by 1945, it already was down to 60,000. The war ended in August, and in September, employment dropped to 35,000. But Lockheed had prepared for peace. The company was ahead of the other aircraft manufacturers with a new commercial airliner to offer. The Constellation first flew in 1943. The first 15 of these triple-tailed transports were delivered to the Air Corps. Within a few days after the war's end, eight airlines had ordered more than 100 Connies. And the first was delivered to TWA just three months later. The Constellation introduced a new age of air travel. 
more comfort for the passenger, greater speed, longer range. Lockheed also continued to build military aircraft after the war. The Neptune was a new Navy patrol plane designed for long-range crews. In 1946, the truculent Turtle set a long-distance record Australia to Ohio non-stop more than 11,000 miles. Production of the F-80 jet fighter continued, and 5,000 of a two-place trainer version also were turned out. In the late 1950s, Lockheed went into production on the prop jet Electra, named after the company's first all-metal airplane of the early 30s. The new Electra was fast and economical, and it served airlines around the world but turbojet transports were entering the market and orders dwindled for the propeller-driven Electra. Even so, 170 of them were sold. Hailed as the missile with the man in it, the F-104 Starfighter was developed in the 1950s for the U.S. Air Force and went on from there in eight different models to become the most widely used fighter ever assembled. Over the next two decades, more than 2,500 of the supersonic aircraft were produced in the United States and six foreign countries. Long held in the public mind as a spy plane is the U-2. The sleek, long-winged reconnaissance craft has served in the forefront of our nation's defenses for over 20 years and remains today unmatched for its purpose and design. A new version, now in production, is designated TR-1. While the U-2's military contributions have been considerable, it also serves the nation as a tool of science. Flying in the colors of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, U-2s sweep the Earth like giant condors, recording weather, mapping, and gathering astronomical and other scientific data to help us better manage the Earth's natural resources. The U-2 was the predecessor of what many believed to be the finest reconnaissance aircraft ever built, the SR-71 Blackbird. Literally faster than a speeding bullet, its twin engines more powerful than the Queen Mary, the ability to cruise at altitudes of more than 15 miles, and sensors which allow it to peer hundreds of miles in any direction have put the SR-71 in a class by itself. Designed by Lockheed engineering genius Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, the Blackbirds hold seven world speed and altitude records. Traveling at speeds in excess of 2,000 miles per hour, or three times the speed of sound, SRs have coursed across states the size of Montana in under 14 minutes. Flown coast to coast in a little over an hour and crossed the Atlantic in less than two. Perhaps even more remarkable, though, is the fact that today, after almost two decades of reconnaissance service with the United States Air Force, there still isn't another airplane that can touch it, top it, or come even close. As evidenced by the SR-71, part of Lockheed's tradition of excellence has always been to combine superior technology with durability. Probably nowhere are these qualities better exemplified than in the venerable and versatile P-3 Orion. Designed and built to accept constant changes and modifications, today's Orions contain the latest avionics, data processing equipment and weapon systems to give them unmatched performance and capability. P-3s have been the U.S. Navy's principal land-based anti-submarine warfare aircraft since their fleet introduction in 1962. P-3s are flown in different models by a growing number of nations whose specific mission requirements for maritime patrol, reconnaissance, search and rescue, and a wide assortment of scientific and environmental assignments have been amply accommodated by the Orion family. Complementing the P-3's anti-submarine warfare capabilities is the carrier-based S-3A Viking, which joined the U.S. Navy fleet in 1974. 
smaller and more compact than the P-3, the Vikings' mission is to protect the Navy's carrier task force from submarines or surface ships. The Viking has speed and endurance and is capable of in-flight refueling for increased range and effectiveness. Like the P-3, the Viking was built with versatility in mind, its basic design suggesting a family of derivatives, such as a cargo passenger transport and an aerial tanker, among others. In one of the boldest steps ever taken by Lockheed, the California company returned to the commercial transport market in the 1970s with a new generation of wide-bodied jetliners, the L-1011 TriStar. From the beginning, the TriStar was designed to be the most sophisticated and technically advanced passenger transport ever built. One that would never be merely on par with the competition, but always ahead of it. Today, after nearly a decade of airline service, the Rolls-Royce-powered TriStar has established new standards as not only the most dependable and the quietest of the wide bodies, but one of the most economical to operate as well. A combination that's hard to beat. While it is advanced technology that most characterizes the L-1011, comfort was not overlooked. A wide variety of spacious and relaxed seating arrangements and gourmet galleys for the preparation of superb meals have made the TriStar a four-star favorite with passengers around the world. It began passenger service in 1972 and now flies the routes of many of the world's major airlines. Flying in four different models, with improved performance versions and future derivatives currently in preparation, the L-1011 is set to meet the demanding challenges of the world's airlines well into the 21st century. Paralleling the L-1011's flight into the next century, Lockheed designers are already hard at work on new ideas for tomorrow. On the drawing boards, in computers, and being tested in wind tunnels, transports of the future are developing today. Emerging technologies which only recently appeared as dreams and theoretical design concepts are moving closer to reality. True to its long tradition of excellence, Lockheed is putting shape to the great promise of tomorrow. Still, reaching for the stars.